welcome to Dark Horse Matters, the show about people, their passions, and the identification of what fulfillment and happiness means, and the quest to live this life to its fullest. I'm Bev Matayoshi, your host, and it has been a really long time since I posted my last episode. Lots of events happening and brewing, but we are back, and we are back strong with a lineup of guests that will inspire and ignite. Today, I have a family member on the show, and I'm really excited to introduce him to you guys because he truly fits the profile of what being passionate about what what he does. From the day we first met, this is like probably a couple of decades ago. Wow. There was never a question in my mind about what, what profession he was going to pursue because he just being in his presence literally makes my mouth water. And I just get sad because I can't smell the food through the computer screen because he's all the way in Hawaii and I'm all the way over here in Atlanta. And this is how we, I see my family these days is through a computer, but he is going to share his story with you today and it's going to be very inspiring. So please give a warm welcome to Chef Paul Rivera. Aloha. Hey, thank you so much for coming on here and, you know, just sharing your passions in life and inspiring other people because a lot of people are searching out there they don't even really know you know what they want or what what could be so I love meeting people like you and being in your presence because um, it's just evident you know like some people just know what they love and I just want to hear the story of how yours came to fruit and came to be can you tell the audience Paul, a little bit about where you grew up, for one, um, and where you're from. Okay, so originally I was born in the Philippines. Um, I'm a first-generation immigrant. I came here when I was one years old. The reason why was my dad had a s- siblings of eight, and they grew up on a big farm in Laguna. And throughout his whole life, and I think five generations, they grew up being farmers. And when my dad, I think he was the only one in our family at the time that had a college degree and he wanted to do something better than just be a farmer and, and opportunity in America was the best place for his family. And at the time he only had my older sister, Carmela and myself. So they decided that he would give up his government job. Um, and which is a good job back in the Philippines to come to America and pursue something better for our family, which I'm glad he did because eventually um he was able to bring the rest of his seven other siblings to america and um, to this day every one of my cousins are americanized i could say and a lot of them don't ever want to go back to the philippines and farm because it's such a hard work so being here after one years old came to america um we grew up in i would say ghetto places to me i thought it was like a hotel because we grew up in Mara Rights and then we went to um, Pearl Harbor and stayed there for a while. We jumped around, but I eventually grew up in Wahiawa and, you know, as luck would have it, it would be the same school that um, one of my mentors that I looked up to was Alan Wong. He graduated from Lelahua High School, but at the time I didn't know. So I grew up in Wahiawa and then um, basically I'm, I live in Kaneohe now because I was lucky enough to meet your cousin. So I'm here right now. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I just find it very, um, what a coincidence that you grew up from a family that are farmers. And here you go, marrying into a family of farmers. Because, <laughs> you know, I grew up on a farm. You know, that's what my father was. It was who he was. Um, he really loved, um, you know, just growing fruits and vegetables. Like that was his passion in life, you know. And I just, I just think that's so cool that, you know, how that ended up. But do you remember the very first time you ever cooked anything? Like, do you have a memory of that? Oh, yeah. Like, I think, um, because at the time, both of our parents have to work. I mean, not not like nothing changed nowadays, but I think they used to call us latchkey kids because when we used to go home, there was no parents. So we had our keys attached to us and we'd open our door and then we'd be on our own. So at an early age, I had to learn how to cook. And being... The second oldest, I kind of like practiced my leadership skills and voted myself to be the leader and told everyone what to do, (laughs) (laughs) which worked out good now because I'm a leader now in a position. But um, teaching my 
my older sister and my younger siblings how to cook. And I would just use learn by watching my grandma cook. And during the weekends, we'd go up to my grandma's house and she would cook Filipino food. That's how I grew up. So I learned how to cook rice using an old pot, not do your measuring cup and press the button and walk away. You had to literally wash the rice till it was clear. And then I would save the rice washings to make our soup later. But that was one of the other things I learned. And then um, we'd cook the rice in one of those old Filipino pots and bring it to a boil. And then we'd let it simmer. And then after that, we'd let it cook. And then you could tell when it's done, when the steam would stop coming out. And then you you'd take the rice and pinch it and then it would be done. And Growing up, my dad would always complain because he was a farmer. He would say, you eat every grain of rice because it takes 120 days for the rice to develop. And then I was like, oh. okay, whatever. You know, but I didn't realize until one day I went to a your guy's farm and helped them do the sweet potatoes. And doing that thing was back breaking the hot sun, flipping the leaves and then harvesting mm -hmm. it and washing it. <laughs> and then when I went back to work, my current job, I'd be like, hey, don't waste potatoes because those things are, are a pain in the butt to grow. So Absolutely. I appreciate <laughs> Yeah, but that was the first thing I learned how to cook was rice. Wow. You know, I still cook rice like that to this day. I don't even have a rice cooker, but I cook oh, it. I'll buy you rice. one. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's probably just pure laziness to actually go out and get one. But yeah, it doesn't take long. And I don't eat a whole lot of rice anymore. You know, diabetes runs in our family. Right. <laughs> but that's such a cool story to hear. Um, do you remember the moment you knew that you wanted to be a chef? Like, when did okay. that realization happen? Well, I realized at an early age that people got to eat. So I, I, I took it to, upon myself to try and learn as much as I could. And then um, growing up, not necessarily being rich, but not being poor, because my dad chose to spend quality time with his family versus working two jobs and giving us whatever he wanted. He, he, his priority was having family time and teaching us the concept of hard work and all that. So um, when I started working, um, my first job was delivering paper and I was like, okay, I don't want to do this job because this is not satisfying and, and just delivering paper to someone that always complains that, hey, my paper's wet or you delivered in the wrong spot, whatever. But I do enjoy cooking. And I didn't realize what a term chef was at the time because I was in elementary growing up, but I did know I liked cooking until one day I saw a, a TV show of a chef cooking and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. They make nice stuff. And I'd never seen cooking like that before. For me, it was growing up comfort food and Filipino food. So then I was kind of interested in, okay, let me see if I can enter that program and see if I can be a good cook or even a chef. And I didn't realize being a chef entitles more than just cooking. It entitles counseling, ag administrative, planning, cost control, all that kind of stuff. And, and the most important thing is working with people and communicating people. So what are the things that you have to learn if you want to become a chef? But working just with food is just one small aspect of being a chef. Interesting. Yes. Like when you hear the word chef you all you think about is the cooking and the prepping or of actually handling the food but yeah you don't rarely think about all the other things that go into it and i love the fact that you mentioned leadership because um i can just imagine like when you're in a restaurant and you're you have to make sure everything happens there's so many things happening at one time you know like that takes leadership <laughs> and if you're a good chef that can make everything run smoothly in a restaurant I mean I can't even imagine the chaos that happens in there behind the scenes you know and that is yeah I, I I think it's called controlled chaos like um preparing and planning for the worst thing to eventually happen but also preparing yourself for success so um being let me, let me step back a little bit but as far as leadership I learned it from the military because I spent uh, 14 years in the uh, Hawaii Army National Guard. When I first went in, it was actually a um, good story. Uh, I'll, I'll tell it to you, but my son might hear it, but he'll, he never heard that story before. But growing up, I was what they considered kolohe. And then um, <laughs> I considered myself adventurous and wanting to try things to the maximum limit to see how far I could go. But um, so my parents said, hey, you know, you have a lot of energy. Let's enroll you in the military teach you some discipline and 
and teach you respect for authority and all that. So I said, okay. So I think I was 16 years old when I, they signed me over. So I went and um, did my military training right after high school. I think I was 17 years old. I was 17 years old on my birthday at boot camp, and I was thinking to myself, like, wow, wh how, where did I get myself into? But it was a good thing hindsight because. It taught you a lot about being organized, how to deal with difficult people, how to deal with adverse situation and how to come and how to think outside of the box to make sure that you accomplish your goals and mission. So when I transitioned into the culinary school schooling, um, I, I kind of had a little bit head start, even though I was at a younger age. I think I was only 18 when I went to um, KCC. And then um, on top of that, finishing my military career, which I was a baker, and then going throughout my career and as a baker, we'd go to the field and we'd bake bread for the guys on the field. And they would totally appreciate because they were just eating MREs. And when you drive by and they smell the bread and you give them a loaf of bread, they're so happy. You know, and we literally had to like drive to the field, to the desert, wherever it was, and set up our baking structure, which, which would include a buffalo or a water tank, our mixer, couple generators and our, our deuce and a half trucks and of course you have to pull security and all that stuff for, for me i was mostly like the baker so i learned how to one of the first thing i learned was to be a baker and then that kind of fueled my passion and i registered to go to kcc and then when i went to kcc i decided to go to school at nighttime because there was a lot more adults at night so i figured i could learn more from them so going to that i, I went to school with a lot of the people that were already in, in the industry so going to school, a lot of them said, hey, are you working right now? I said, not really. So I said, hey, why don't you come apply? Oh, hold on, you, you froze. We were talking about your educational uh, journey um, before we got rudely interrupted by internet. But um, I just kind of want to interject a little bit. Like when I first met you, um, your, your wife, ooh, <laughs> your Sorry. wifey, came to visit my cousin came to visit us in los angeles and um i guess you guys were in san diego at the time um and i just remember having a conversation about you um i guess your experience with going to a, a slaughterhouse and you're 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 so passionate about talking about the whole process and you know just that's just a part of um you know, learning about how to cook. And, and I just, I don't even really remember exactly what the conversation was, but I just remember the energy that that was coming out of you and how passionate you were, you know? So I kind of wanted to go a little bit more into, deeper into your educational background with regards to cooking. And you were kind of mentioned you went to the military, you were working with baking, and then you were also, um, you started going to school at KCC. Um, after that, like during that whole process, like what else have you, what other educational background do you have with, with cooking? Yeah, so um, after um, going to culinary um, school in KCC, there was a program for the state of Hawaii that wanted to um, educate the cooks to become the next level. So they asked me if I wanted to join the program, which is a state of Hawaii apprenticeship program. It was a four year program. So I figured, okay, I might as well join. But then they said, oh, you have to be in a hotel. I was like, okay, great. So now I have to apply for a hotel. So I had a sponsor that um, helped me out, which is Sheraton Waikiki. So I was able to become their apprentice for four years there. And working in a hotel was an eye opener because you got to totally see the Hawaii industry in its full capacity. So working with the dishwashers or the stewards and seeing how they operate in a high level how they move dishes, silverware, how they stock, cleaning, all that kind of things. And then working with the orderings um, and see how much volume they go through and then the costs as far as what it costs to operate each, re each restaurant. And then also in that program, working with all our executive chefs at different restaurants and seeing and learning from them. So that's where I got to excel a lot of my um, education and techniques that I learned today. and. After that, I asked my chef at the time, hey, what do, I, what do I do after this? Like, do I become a chef now that I finished? He's like, oh, no, no, there's a lot more to just being a chef, like cooking, like I was saying earlier. I said, well, what do, you, what do I need to do? He said, well, you're going to have to gain experience. You're going to have to work with different chefs, put your time in, 
pick their brain, learn as much as you can, give them 100% of your energy and, and dedication. Then when you're done, something else comes along that's better, then you, it's time for you to move on. So I've done that in an accelerated rate. And then I think um, after finishing my apprenticeship program, my, my, my ex-in-laws at the time, they were planning to open an Italian restaurant called Asagio's. And before that, they had a restaurant called Paisano's. And this was in the early 90s, I think it was. So they said, hey, do you want to open a restaurant in Mililani? I said, oh, yeah, why not? Like, I was only 22 or 23 at the time. I said, okay, so they're okay. So let's go meet with the contractor. Let's go design the kitchen. Let's go figure out how you want to build it. Let's work on the menu and, and work on your purveyors and all that legal stuff you need and the financial stuff, ordering the equipment, hiring people, training them. So that's, I got an early taste of reality at age 22. So opening a Sajos, I think it was back in 1992 and building that kitchen from scratch and training people was a, was, was a good learning experience for me because I got to deal with um, different vendors, difficult staff, difficult guests at the time. And when I was young, I'd be like, yes, whatever you want. Okay, let's do it. But then as you learn and get older, you have to figure out when to put your foot down and you have to say, no, this is what needs to get done because we don't need like 10 bosses in the restaurant. You need the chef, you need the manager, and that's it. Everyone else, you guys can go step aside and let us do our job. So that's, what, that's one of the things I learned. And then because of that, moving forward, I got to work at all these different places and different restaurants until the place I am today. So from Asajos, I moved to a catering company. I worked at different country clubs and then worked at a hotel, obviously. And then I got to work at Cheesecake Factory when they opened, doing the high volume at the time. And I think when you first opened the Cheesecake Factory in, in Hawaii, we were the biggest cheesecake factory at that time. And I was shocked when people would actually wait two hours to eat food. I'd be like, oh, no, thank you. I'll just go next door or eat. But after that, uh, Dukes um, wanted a high energy, high organized manager. And my wife at the time was working at Hula Grill. And she said, hey, why don't you come apply at Dukes? I said, okay, I applied. And I got the job like right away. They said, like, okay, you're, you're, you're high volume. You're young. We'll, we'll work with you. So I, I worked there, and I worked there from 2006 to the present day. And because of that, I got to be an executive chef for a big company that works for um, different types of uh, restaurants under the TS banner. And then I went from Dukes to Hula Grill, back to Dukes, and now I'm back to Hula Grill after the COVID. Yeah. Wow. That You really just got thrown right into it. Like, right out of school like how fortunate are you that those opportunities just kind of fell into your lap like that is just really awesome like and that just kind of goes to show you and your energy that the gravitation probably you just attracted that to you you know and you don't hesitate if you see an opportunity you just jump in there you're I, you know you didn't speak like you had any type of fear at all and at a young age like that is just so cool and that's how you you know, excel quickly. <laughs> wow. That's so cool. I'm so proud of you. My goodness. Yeah. Well, I don't like to talk about myself as much because I think the position I am now, I have the opportunity to actually give back to the community. So I, I instead of just being all about me, it's about training my staff to be better what they're doing, training my sous chefs and my supervisors to actually excel where they want to do and what they want to do in their careers. So if they want to, I'm there to, to help them to be a tool and a mentor to help them get there or that. But my passion right now is to, to train the younger generation kids to show that they have an opportunity to get what they want because the industry is always constantly growing, changing, and you need to be on top of your game. If not, you'll get left behind. So right now where I'm at, I'm, I'm given the opportunity to, to not only give back to the school, but also give back to the community. Yeah. And now you're the mentor. You, you're the apprentice before, and now you get to be the mentor. And they are so lucky to have you. I mean, it, it's important to have a mentor that loves what they're doing and really loves teaching, you know, that that's the best type of mentor to learn from. So while you were in your apprenticeship, like, did you gravitate toward different types of food? Like, 
I mean, you worked at an Italian restaurant. Like, how did you learn how to make Italian food in Hawaii? Everyone just <laughs> eats plate lunch and stuff. You know, like, yeah. how did you learn? That takes a skill to make Italian food. Yeah, so I was also fortunate enough to work at Sheraton, which I had an Italian restaurant called Chow at the time. So I worked with a good chef, um, two chefs over there, actually. And they mentored me. They showed me the traditional way of making your pastas, your marinara, your bolognese, all of that stuff, also buco, learning how to do that. And then I, I, I really appreciated them because they were real Italians at heart. And when they cooked, I saw their passion and what they did. And I kind of like gravitated to cooking Italian food in my early careers. But doing that for like almost 15 years, I got kind of like pasted out. So I wanted to try something different. And when an opportunity came for me to go and do a different uh, type of cuisine, I jumped into it. So, but my, my true passion actually is cooking local food and also cooking um, my heritage foods that I like a lot. But I won't do um, dunuguan or balut. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you guys who don't know what that is, you got you got to look it up. <laughs> right, <laughs> Filipinos, man, we got some we got some um, eclectic food on their <laughs> menu. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but you know, it's just so inspiring to hear. You know, like um, I, I just want to know, like, what through your passion is local type of food. Have, what kind of things have you done, like? just to elevate that food to the next level? Because I know you do it. I see pictures of it on Instagram, you know, like, I'm just like, what is that? It's so beautiful. And it looks like it tastes delicious. <laughs> yeah, so currently right now, um, I work at Hula Grow, and we're all about working with the farmers, local farmers, working with our, our seafood vendors and trying to get products that they produce. And now they're working with us right now. They're actually asking us what can we grow that you would use? So we tell them, hey, we'd like different herbs. We like different types of tomatoes, not just your, your basic tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. And working with also our purveyors, we try and get the best type of quality that we can. And also our corporate helps us a lot by securing um, different types of seafood that we normally wouldn't be able to get on our own as a single restaurant. But because we have a combined TS restaurant, we're able to have that buying power so we're able to lock in prices for protein, for beef, pork, chicken, even um, lobsters. And, and right now things are increasing and we're able to lock it in at least to the end of the year. So that helps out a lot. But, but basically it's just working with food from um, farm to table or ocean to table. And then going back to the things that growing up, as long as you learn the basic fundamentals and you can be creative. Because when I first was going to school, I remember them telling me that, oh, you can't mix fruits with sauces because that's not, that's a big no-no. And then when Roy and Alan came along and Sam Choi, they came along, they were doing the exact opposite. And I was like, wait, these guys are like the new generation chefs and I would like to like see what they're doing. And those, those are the uh, godfathers of Hawaii cuisine that we kind of gravitated to so a lot of their cooking was inspired by them but also us growing up with our our heritage i try to incorporate some of the filipino techniques in some of our dishes and obviously we I have my other sous chef is from maui so he's local guy he does that and we have different um types of cooking we do it's, it's not just one type but mm -hmm. i i would like to say that we keep it simple keep it fresh and make sure that you have a good play, favorite profile when you're making it. And of course, a lot of people look with their eyes. So mm -hmm. if they see it looks good, then they're going to automatically be like, wow, this is great. And then when they taste it, the first taste is, oh, this is good. And then it, the back flavor, they taste, oh, this is a little heat in here, or a little sweetness, or a little bit of vinegar. And they enjoy the dish. So for me, I, I think I really enjoy making dishes with people that appreciate it. Like I consider myself an, a construction art artist where they would – eat it and destroy it and I have to make another one again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, do you have a lot of, um, so you have a lot of uh, creative control as with as far as the menu, like, or do you guys have to stick to a certain type of, or you have, you can actually create stuff and introduce it to the menu. 
Yes, we all, we ha it's a little bit of everything. Um, we try to keep into the concept with Cooler Grill, and then we also try and do research and development. We make different things. We do a lot of different specials and events, and we make, we showcase our, our different um, menus that we can, our different specials, and if they like it, then we incorporate back into our menu. So that's, that's pretty much like cars. When they do that, they do a lot of research and development. We do that with our food. Same thing. We, um, we make it. If they like it, if they don't, we tweak it. And we also have to make sure it fits within the food cost, uh, cost concept. We don't want to just give them the whole kitchen sink and we don't make a profit also. So exactly. there's a little give and take. Yeah. But that's really exciting that you guys have that control and that you can, you can experiment and, you know, cause that's, that's what brings fulfillment. Right. So you, can you give us a little bit of insight on your leadership? Like I imagine like working in a restaurant because of that chaotic environment, but controlled chaotic chaos, like how you called it. Um, how important is culture? Like, and I imagine you create a really nice culture in your work environment. You know, I don't see you as being like the dictator that doesn't smile and, and you know, have fun while you're working. So yeah, how, so how do you, um, how do you create that environment? Okay. So a quick story, my son growing up and he's only 13 now, but when he was watching, I think, um, Iron Chef or was that Hell's Kitchen? He came up to me and he's like, Dad, you're a chef, right? I was like, yes. I said, so do you yell at people and you throw stuff and you swear at them? I said, no, I do not do that. He's like, but they do that on TV. I was like, well, they, they don't want to be, be bored. But yes, I, I, I do do all those things, but I do it in a, a good communicative, communicative manner. I try and praise in public and try and counsel in, in private and then try and coach with changing their behaviors to be what they want. And I reward good behaviors also. Like when they do something that we expect them to do, then we give them things that we call in our restaurant hula bucks. And they say, hey, good job being uh, safe or good job following the recipes or thanks for helping out. And we give them, do, and they can use it to eat in our restaurant or buy supplies or whatever it is they need. Instead of spending, spending their own money, they use that as cash and we help them. So it's a win-win situation. We create a good environment for our staff and also create an environment where they want to do good because they get rewarded. And at the same time, um, we also give our, our people opportunity to move up in the rank because a lot of our supervisors, our sous chef have moved up. A lot of our lead cooks moved up from dishwasher prep to cook to lead cooks and supervise. So there is a lot of opportunity. That's why I always try and go back to the schools and try and tell them that there's a lot of opportunity. We've catered and we've mentored schools from Kaimuki, Roosevelt, uh, Farrington, and I'm trying to get back to my alumni, Lilo, who I went back there a couple months ago to try and get them back in the program. So I think next week I'm actually doing a video shoot at the restaurant for the, uh, the DEO, right? Department of Education. Yeah. And my wife always teased me because I'm a little bit dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> DOE. <laughs> DOE, yeah. Okay. There you go. Correct me. <laughs> no, actually, this is great um, uh, segue to what I wanted to talk about next because you said you're, you like to get into the, the schools. Like, I, I think that is just so amazing of you to like want to extend that mentorship beyond the restaurant and into the schools because you got to spread that passion in people because there will always be a need for for people in your industry. And right now, you know, at post pandemic, you know, people are just a little, I don't know, burnt out and a little crazy, you know, like, and everyone wants to feel something, you know, this passion again, you know, to kind of create that normalcy again. But so you're going to be, can you tell us a little bit about this interview you're going to be doing? Like, what's all that about? And how did you get that opportunity? Okay, so I've, I've been doing this for I think the last eight years, I think, uh, mentoring high school students. And because of that, a lot of the schools that we mentored, we actually end up hiring them and they end up working in the industry. And some of them move to be the front of the house or continue their education and going to other culinary schools. But for the most part, we give them the opportunity to work in the industry with us. And they've been really great hires and really great students of the culinary. 
And this one was came up to the opportunity because we work with other chefs, not just myself, but other chefs in the state of Hawaii to mentor the different high school kids for different high schools. And Haley McEnany was the one in charge. And she came up to me and said, hey, I remember you speaking at Lelahua and also at Farrington. And my God, your passion about where you came from and, and the kids' eyes opened up when you talked about where you came from and what you used to do and where you're at now. And I think that that would be a good video so we can like um, get get more people and trying to impact more. So I'll say, okay, whatever works. So they're going to come to Hula Grill, I think, next week. And we're going to shoot a four-hour episode to try and get that part. But for the most part, I'm just a tool to help give kids opportunity to see if this is what they want to do. Because um, here, we give them opportunity. We run through the program, our internship program, where they work the dish two days. They learn about proper washing techniques, proper sanitation, proper safety on carrying plates and on chemicals. And then they work in a pantry, to learn the basic knife skills, learn how to follow recipes, learn what is a critical control, control point, what is the safety structure for the HACCP program, all of that. And then we teach them how to cook. And we teach them how to work as a team, team effort, creating a dish, because it's not just only you. Mm -hmm. You work as a team to create the dish together to bring it out to the guests. And then after that, they come work with our supervisors, learn how to manage different areas of um, the kitchen. And then at their last two days, they work with me and I teach them how to actually be a chef, looking through numbers, looking through our menu mix, our P&Ls, and show them how to plan a menu, what it goes, what each item costs, and how to get a good cost, how to figure out what's a good profit margin, all that kind of stuff. And they're like, wow, this is really good. And then at the end, if they like it, then they can continue. If not, they're like, well, this is not for me. And then we at least gave them the opportunity to try and see if, because like they say in the kitchen, if you can't stand the heat, you need to get out. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You know, and experienced that when I was in dental hygiene school too. A lot of people had the academics, you know, but when it came to having the hands and the dexterity and the communicable, uh, the ability to communicate, you know, effectively, some people just didn't have that, you know. And you know, you don't you don't want to end up in the field and then realize it, you know. You want to understand what you're getting into, and I think that's a great filter filtering system that you guys have that can really inspire kids to really know what it's like and to see if that that is for them it's really cool yeah yeah so you know um my son i think he's 13 now but i'm trying to like work with him on my days off we cook things and he asks me questions and he's like hey dad why is the beef jerky in the store it doesn't taste like our beef jerky i was like, oh because we make it fresh and we don't put a lot of preservatives it's like oh can you teach me how to make beef jerky so I think that started the program of him wanting to learn. And then, of course, me wanting to be a teacher is a good thing. So uh, another funny story was when my son saw me cooking breakfast for them. He thought, oh, this is pretty easy, making eggs. So he said, Dad, can my friends come over, sleep over? I said, yeah, sure, whatever. So I came work late one day, and I woke up late later, and he was already making breakfast. And then my wife goes, don't walk in the kitchen. I was like, why? Because the kitchen's a disaster. I said, what do you mean? He's like, there's eggs all over the place. So I go there, and then there's eggs on the floor, eggs on the stove, and the pan's sticky, and the eggs are like, I, I would say, well done. <laughs> but that's the way he had to learn. But now, I guess, learning from experience, trial and error, he's actually a really good um, cook in the kitchen. And I think one day he's going to be, he'll thank me for giving the opportunity because I never had a mentor that, at an early age to cook. I had to wait till I was in college. So he had a good head start. Yeah. And, you know, I, I see you guys cooking together on Instagram. And if you guys want to follow him, she at Chef Paul Rivera, follow him. And you guys can see, you know, the, the, the images. And I just wish that I could smell the food through the screen. You know, it just looks so delicious. But I just love that connection that you have with Peyton, you know, um, cooking together. I... I'm not a very good cook, but I, I did during the pandemic, you know, when we had two months away from work, I did teach my kids how to cook a little bit like spaghetti. And the other day, my son was all proud of himself because he made his own hot dog, which is not really <laughs> cooking, but <laughs> at okay. least he Get can survive. At least he can survive right. if I'm not there and actually prepare a yeah. meal. For yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, I think that's so amazing that you have that connection with him. That is so cool. And your wife is a really good cook too. Uh, she's yeah, she cooked did. for me before and I love every time when she makes something, it tastes so delicious. Yeah. You know, she's really a good supervisor because she always tells me what things I need to fix and all that stuff because we work together at work also, right? Because she's an office manager. But, you know, my wife, and which is your cousin, also wanted to teach my kids the value of um, farming and where vegetables came from. Because I think at one time they were like, oh, yeah, just go to the store and pick it up. And I was like, well, you know, this corn takes a long time to grow. And we actually planted a couple months ago corn on, on the farm. And um, I think he, we actually uh, were able to pick some of the, the fruits of the harvest and try it. And it was really good. I mean, I, I, I am lucky and blessed that my family, your guys' family, have a farm that we can go and plant things. Because if there ever was an apocalyptic, uh, whatever, catastrophe. Apocalyptic, yeah, apocalyptic, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> we can survive because this is a true story. Also, my son, um, two weeks ago, he actually had to learn how to pluck and debone a chicken. Oh, so, my God. <laughs> so him and, and your nephew went on the farm and they had to boil the chicken, pluck it, and debone it and chop it up. And they made um, uh, papaya, green papaya soup with, obviously, the ingredients from the farm. So papaya, kalamogai leaves, the ginger, the lemongrass, all, all which mm. came from the farm. So that Yum. was a good experience that they could, but then... They were like, Dad, why is the chicken so skinny? <laughs> <laughs> it's not big like the ones in the store. I said, like, yeah, because the ones in the store, they, they just raise them for consumption. This one is, is the ones in the wild. So you get your pick of the litter. Yeah, that is so, that is hilarious. But that, what a skill, you know, not everybody gets to learn how to cook a chicken from literally <laughs> from scratch. Correct. That's so cool. Can you remember, like, if you had to choose one meal that you've ever made in your life, what was the best meal that you've ever prepared and served to people? Uh, there is a, a lot that I can't really remember. But the one thing that I try to remember when making a meal is thinking about the guests and then thinking about what's important to them, what's their, what, what proteins they like, what are their favorite vegetables, what type of things brings them back to their childhood and all that. And I, we've done a lot in my past, but I think one of them that really did mean something to me was cooking a dinner for a family whose son passed away because of cancer. So we did a, a meal in remembrance of, of him. And I asked him, hey, what, what are the some of the favorite things that your son used to like and we made a menu a dish based on all that and and we made it for the family and i think it was like 40 people that w went and at the end the parents came and they were crying in tears because they were so happy that we made things that remembered what they they liked and of course we we made it in an elevated status of course mm -hmm. you know and and they really enjoyed it and that's one of the things I find a lot of pleasure is making things that people enjoy. And when it comes back and the plate's empty, I know I did my job. Yeah, yeah. And just that emotional tie to the food. Like, I feel like food, it, it can bring families together. It can bring people together. It's a way to share experiences with each other. And that is just so important. And, you know, after the past few years of isolation, you know, the fact that you can have a meal together, um, it's just, that is just what I look forward to. Like, uh, you know, growing up, we always had such big parties for Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, like, um, that is just has always been my favorite times of the years when everyone gets together to eat. And even if it's something is like a, like a funeral even, or a, a graduation or a wedding, you know, like those times when you can come together and share meals with your family or with friends. I mean, that that's just truly special. But if you can tie that food to the emotions of, you know, what's happening or what the event is, that just makes it even more special. And I can just see why you're passionate about that, you know, and you're good at that. You're really, really good at that, Paul. 
Well, I mean, thank you. I just, I just enjoy what I'm doing. I mean, even every year, like my younger sister, while she was learning how to be a good housewife and a good cook, she'd call me every week before Thanksgiving. Okay, can you tell me the recipe how to make the turkey? I said, you know, you need to write this down because every year you call me <laughs> how to do the turkey. I said, but you make it so good. And I was like, okay. So I think now she got it down already. But I, I, I do enjoy cooking for family. You know, um, we just, I just did a graduation uh, a week ago. And then they asked me, hey, can you make your famous uh, salt, pepper, shrimp? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So we're making it and, we're, I'm, and I'm cooking at the site. And then my son's like, dad, should we cook it now? I said, no, we, we, we prep the shrimp, we, marin we season the shrimp, we marinate it. When they come, it's literally going to take three minutes at 350 degrees. So it'll be quick. He said, why don't you want to do it now? I said, no, I want to give it to them fresh and hot. They can enjoy it. And then at the end, we can put them with our, our different sauces that we made in our garnish. So time come, people here were frying it. And then, oh, dad, smells so good. Can I have some? So he's helping me cook. So by the time we're ready for dinner, I was like, so what, Peyton, you ready to eat? He's like, oh, no, I'm so full. I ate so much shrimp. <laughs> He's eating while you're cooking, right? <laughs> yeah, that's why I need to be careful. I have to like, only taste the food. I can't be like sitting down enjoying. Like I, I think being a chef and trying to stay fit and also trying to maintain your quality, you, you have to taste everything. And at the same time, you have to train your cooks to taste and set the expectation high as far as how they set their mise en place, how they go about in cooking each dish. So it's always the same from the first guest to the last guest. Mm -hmm. And doing that, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge because not many people have the passion to cook. It's just their job. So I, I do what they call the 80-20 method. I spend 80% of my time with the 20% of people that are focused on it. And I try and develop their skills so that it can in turn help them grow and also help the restaurant because the, the level of quality is, is raised. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I just really appreciate, you know, just your level of passion in teaching people. Cause I mean, that is just, I always look at the world now and um, teachers, you know, they have such an important job. Our teachers have the job to inspire others, you know, and if you have that gift, you know, it just, um, it just spreads the love, you know, because when what, you have to love what you do, and you, you gain that love through somebody that has come into your life that has that same kind of passion, at least that's how I see it. You know, that's how I found the things that I'm passionate about in life. So very, very awesome. I love hearing your story. You're so inspiring. And I just can't wait to hear more about this video that you're doing, you know, to inspire the kids um, uh, in Hawaii, learning about the culinary arts. That is just so special that you're a part of that. And congratulations for getting that opportunity. So proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank you. And I just thank everybody in the audience for joining us here on Dark Horse Matters today. And just, you know, look out there, be open to what comes your way, what you view and what, and just, you know, really be open to seeing what inspires you. Because my whole goal about this show is to in, ignite that fire in people. If, you're, if you don't know what it is that you want in life, you know, you're not going to figure that out unless you experience life, meet people and, and really, really be open to seeing the passion in others, because that's how you find yours with it. So with that being said, thank you so much. And we will see you at the next episode. Be passionate. <laughs>